Chapter 3, Section 2. This is about atomic structure. In the previous section, we learned where the elements came from. They came from astronomical processes of nuclear fusion and supernova explosions. Now, we want to be able to describe our atomic structure. The atomic structure is this. You have protons in the nucleus, and protons have a positive charge. Neutrons are also found in the nucleus, and they have a neutral charge. Now, protons and neutrons have about the same mass. Orbiting the nucleus are electrons, and they have a negative charge, and they are much lighter than both protons and neutrons. In any neutrally charged atom, the number of electrons will equal the number of protons. The atomic number of an element is equal to the number of protons. So we've got the four most abundant elements of any living organism. That would include you. That's hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. The atomic number, the number of protons, is that number 1 for hydrogen, 6 for carbon, 7 for nitrogen, and 8 for oxygen. Now one thing about the atomic number, as you go from 6 to 7 protons, you change the atomic number, you also change the element. So when we say we have 92 naturally occurring elements, that means there's between 1 and 92 protons inside of the nucleus of that element. Change the number of protons, you will always change the element. The next one is the atomic mass. Protons and neutrons are about the same mass. So you combine them together, you get the atomic mass. In our common elements here, hydrogen would have an atomic mass of 1, carbon would be 12, nitrogen 14, and oxygen 16. That means in these elements like carbon, there are 6 protons, plus six neutrons. Nitrogen has seven neutrons and seven protons, and most oxygen atoms have eight protons and eight neutrons. So what exactly is an element? We've talked about hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. So elements are atoms. And a lot of people just say that the atoms are the building blocks of the universe. So when you look out across the universe, you're looking at atoms. And that's partly true. Don't forget they're made up of those subatomic particles. But an element is the smallest unit of matter that maintains chemical properties, and you can't change it by chemical reactions. So no matter how hard you try, carbon will always be carbon. It doesn't matter if it's in methane and you react it with oxygen to form carbon dioxide and water, that carbon will remain carbon forever. And in fact, the carbon in you is over 5 billion years old. So are the oxygen atoms. So are the nitrogen atoms. And you have carbon in you, that may have been in a dinosaur living over 100 million years ago. And the reason is chemical reactions do not change the elements. Only nuclear reactions are capable of doing that. Lastly, we have isotopes. Now, an isotope is an element that has the same chemical properties. That means they have the same number of protons. However, they can vary in the number of neutrons. So helium, for example, can have three neutrons, four neutrons, five neutrons, even six neutrons. Carbon can have six neutrons, we call that carbon 12. It can have 13 neutrons, we call that carbon 13. And it can have 14 neutrons, and we call that carbon 14. And you might even be familiar with carbon 14 because it's radioactive, it's unstable. So if you get an unstable combinations of neutrons and protons, typically you have too many neutrons, the nucleus becomes unstable and it will decay into another element. Many isotopes are very stable. Carbon-12 is one of them. It's been around for the last five billion years. And in fact, you have carbon atoms in you that were probably in a dinosaur 100 million years ago. And those carbon atoms will be around long after you're gone. And in fact, they'll be around for billions, if not trillions of years. And in fact, carbon-12 is such a stable isotope that we don't even know how long it will be around because we've really never seen one decay. Now, carbon-14 is a different beast. Carbon-14 has eight neutrons. That is not stable. It's got too many. So what happens is carbon-14 emits an electron and a neutron becomes a proton and now you get nitrogen-14. So it has a half-life has a very specific rate of decay that doesn't matter like what the temperature is or the pressure, what kind of chemical reactions it is. Half-lives are steady throughout the entire age of the universe. 
So carbon-14 has a half-life of 5,730 years. So if I start out with a pound of carbon-14, after one half-life, 5,730 years, I have half a pound of carbon-14. After two half-lives, double the amount of time, 11,460 years. I now have a quarter of a pound of it. And after three half-lives, once again, tack on the same amount of time, and you now have one-eighth of the original amount you had. Now, some isotopes only last millionths of a second. Others, like uranium-238, this is the heaviest occur naturally occurring isotope, and basically it has a half-life of 4.468 billion years, which helps us out quite a bit. There are a lot of different types of radioisotopes. Carbon-14 is one, uranium-238 is another one, and they all have a unique half-life. And we can use these radioisotopes to date fossils fairly accurately. And it's really nice when you have three or four different radioisotopes, each giving you basically the same date on a fossil. Here's one more really interesting fact about atoms. They are mostly empty space. Let me give you some perspective on that. This is Doak Campbell Stadium. This is home to the Florida State Seminoles in Tallahassee, Florida, and they won a few national championships while I was around. Now, I got my undergraduate degree at Florida State in the early 90s, but this stadium holds 80,000 people, so it's pretty large. If you were a nucleus, then your protons and neutrons would be ping pong balls on the 50-yard line, and your electrons would be fleas orbiting just outside of the stadium. So by now, I hope you get the idea that we are tied to the cosmos. Our building blocks of matter, the protons, neutrons, and electrons, they're over 13.7 billion years old. They were created during the Big Bang. And then we're tied to astronomical processes, stellar processes, through nuclear fusion. The elements in you, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, sodium, potassium, chlorine, iron, they were all created inside of stars. The heavier metals, like gold, lead, mercury, and silver, were actually created when stars exploded. So as you can see, not only do we depend on our sun for energy, but we also re required other stars that lived and died billions of years ago to give us the elements that make us up today.